Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Mallet Technologies webinar series. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, today's webinar is subject is ANSYS uh, Fluid Structure Interaction. My name is Boz Marshy. I'm the account manager here at Mallet Technology. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by our principal consulting engineer, uh, Michael Owen who's also in the office with me here in uh, Durham, North Carolina. Today's agenda, we'll give a quick overview of Mallet technology, then we'll have our webinar on ANSYS fluid structure interaction. And at the end, we'll have time for um, questions and, and any discussion. There also is a um, questions in a chat window in the um, webinar box and if you'd like to put any questions in there you can and Mike will um, attempt to answer those at the uh, end of the webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded um, so you can uh, access the recording via our website at uh, mallet.com. In addition to Mallet technology we use world-class engineering software tools combined with a broad knowledge and expertise Help our clients compete in today's marketplace, produce reliable and cost-effective products. Mallet Technology has been serving engineering customers for over 40 years. We have our um, office locations in Durham, North Carolina and Columbia, Maryland. We offer ANSYS consulting services and all ANSYS physics, including structural, uh, fluid dynamics and electromagnetic. We also offer ANSYS training at our Mallet locations or at a customer location. We offer ANSYS software sales in the states of Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina. Training and consulting, um, it can be anywhere in the world or the country. Software sales are in, in those states. We've been an ANSYS channel partner since 1985, so we've been around almost as long as ANSYS. We have strategic partnerships with some other channel partners. Ozen Engineering is a uh, strategic partner of ours. They're located in California with their main office in Silicon Valley area. And CADFAM America is another partner of ours. They're located in the Midwest with their main U.S. office in Detroit, Michigan. But you can visit us at, at www.mallet.com. Um, or any any additional information or to contact us. Our upcoming activities, our upcoming webinars, our next webinar will be next Friday, and that's on nonlinear contact convergence. Uh, again, you can go to mallet.com to register for that webinar. On Friday, we'll do one on weld strength and fatigue assessment. Um, again, same time, 11 a.m. Um, U.S. Eastern. Um, on May 31st, and then we'll have a webinar June 7th to discuss ANSYS mechanical meshing techniques and tips. Um, you know, meshing is, is uh, something that's um, primary to all kinds of analysis, so that'll be a great webinar for tips and tricks on meshing. Any questions, you can always contact me direct at boz at mallet.com. Um, like I say, the, um, um, at the end of the webinar, we'll have time for questions, but also you have um, um, some windows there at the, um, uh, in, in the um, control panel if you'd like to type in questions as we're going along. So now I'll turn the um, presentation over to Mike, and we'll get started with our webinar on uh, ANSYS uh, FSI. Thank you very much, Boz. Can you uh, hear me? Yes. All right. We will get started. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Michael Owen. I am a principal consulting engineer here at uh, Mallet Technology. I specialize in CFD, uh, electromagnetics, uh, and uh, what I'll call multi-field applications. And today we're going to be talking about fluid structure interaction. All right, so first, um, what is fluid structure interaction? It's pretty straightforward. It's right there in the name. It's when fluids and structures interact. 
<coughs> and you'll have to forgive me, I'm uh, getting over a cold, I have a bit of a cough. Um, so fluid structure interaction occurs whenever fluid flow interacts with a solid body or a structure. It can uh, exert pressures on that structure, which might lead to structural deformations, or it might supply uh, thermal loads, which would lead to um, a heat transfer type problem. Um, the, we can classify uh, fluid structure interactions uh, as either one way or two way. Uh, in a one way problem, the, the physics are loosely enough coupled that we can solve uh, for, for example, the flow field and apply either uh, a pressure distribution to a structure or a uh, heat transfer coefficient distribution uh, to a structure uh, and the resulting structural fields, either the deformation or the temperature uh, are not um, varied enough to cause significant changes in the flow field. In other words, uh, the change in shape of the structure is not significant enough to um, significantly alter the pressure distribution or the temperature distribution um, is not, uh, is not, uh, does not lead to a change in the distribution of heat transfer coefficients. Uh, in that case, we can do a one-way calculation. If on the other hand, the deformations are large enough or the temperature gradients become large enough uh, that they uh, affect the resulting flow field and change the pressure distributions or the heat distribution of heat transfer coefficients, then the problem is more tightly coupled and we would need a two-way solution where we are passing data back and forth between the structural and the thermal solution. Um, so why is FSI important? It's, it's really critical actually in understanding many engineering problems uh, it can be important for understanding fatigue in your structure, um, for material selection. Um, we uh, Examples of fluid structure interactions might be conjugate heat transfer, uh, flow-induced vibration, a particularly nasty variant of which uh, is called aeroelastic flutter. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the classic Tacoma Narrows bridge failure. That was a classic example of flow-induced vibration leading to catastrophic failure. So um, there's a number of different modeling approaches that you can take uh, based on the degree of physical coupling between the fluid and solid uh, solution fields. So really the question is how sensitive is one field to a change in the other field? and vice versa. Fields that are very strongly physically coupled require strong numerical coupling and they're more expensive. Uh, they're generally more difficult to solve. Uh, solution fields that are relatively independent, again, can be solved with weaker coupling or even uncoupled uh, with one-way transfer. So this is just a little plot that illustrates that. On the lower left, we have physically weak coupling for example, conjugate heat transfer, um, small deformations, and we can solve those in a one-way uh, uncoupled fashion where we solve uh, typically the flow field first and then map either pressures or heat transfer coefficients to the structure. Moving up and to the right, you get uh, stronger physical coupling with uh, perhaps more significant deformations um, you might have rigid bodies, for example, uh, a vessel floating uh, in water where the, uh, uh, the movement of the vessel is strongly dependent on the movement of the fluid and the uh, movement of the fluid around the vessel depends on the exact position and attitude uh, of the vessel. Um, moving up into the right, you have um, flow-induced vibrations, uh, that's where your aeroelastic flutter will go. And then even further up and to the right, you have highly deformable solids, biomedicals, uh, membranes, uh, et cetera. And as you move 
up, you get tighter physical coupling. As you move to the right, you get tighter numerical coupling. There's a few ways to handle that we'll talk about. Um, we're not gonna focus too much on one way. It's very straightforward uh, in ANSYS using the project page. Uh, you just set up your individual analyses and you drag the solution cell of your fluid calculation onto the setup cell uh, of your mechanical calculation and there will be an imported load that appears in your outline tree and you can scope it to geometry uh, as appropriate. So uh, fully coupled is uh, the most difficult. Uh, a fully coupled calculation would be fluid and solid equations solved in a single matrix. Um, this is like the mass and momentum equations are coupled in fluent or CFX. Um, or using coupled field elements in the mechanical solver. Uh, the fields are very tightly coupled, as tightly coupled as you can possibly get them. But it's very difficult, uh, typically, to solve a monolithic fluid structure matrix. The equations are very stiff. The time scales can be very different. Um, it's tough uh, and expensive. And typically, the uh, implementation of the fluid equations in a structural solver uh, is not the most efficient. So we would rather use a dedicated structural solver for the structural part of the calculation and a dedicated CFD solver for the fluid part of the calculation. Uh, note that um, mechanical and uh, CFX or fluent cannot be run in a fully coupled fashion. They're just two different solvers, two different sets of matrices. So it's just, uh, it's not the way we approach it. Luckily for us, the vast majority of two-way problems are amenable um, to solving uh, implicitly with multiple codes rather than uh, monolithically inside of a single matrix. So in the two-way iterative implicit approach, the fluid and solid equations are solved separate from each other in two completely different solvers. In the case of ANSYS, the uh, solid equations, structural equations are solved in ANSYS mechanical, and the fluid equations are solved either in CFX or fluent. Um, and this is, this is very similar to how turbulence is handled in a CFD code. It is not fully coupled to the momentum equations. Um, and uh, one feature of this approach, the implicit approach, is that it iterates codes within time to achieve convergence of the uh, load transfers back and forth between structural and fluid solvers. Um, so this is the approach that we use uh, in ANSYS, uh, coupling uh, mechanical to either CFX or fluent. It's supported for both. Um, there is uh, a two-way explicit approach, which is very similar to uh, the previous slide, except there is no iteration uh, within a time step. It is uh, assumed that each time step will be uh, fully converged um, upon first calculation, so there are no uh, subsequent iterations or um, coupling loops or stagger iterations. Um, there's no corrections to the initial cal calculation of the time step. Um, you can do this with mechanical and CFX or fluent simply by forcing it to use a single coupling iteration um, or a single uh, convergence iteration within a time step. It, this is usually not recommended. It generally requires much smaller time steps to ensure that um, upon first calculation that the solution, uh, the data transfer fields are converged. Um, and you can't guarantee that that's the case. Um, so typically, we would not recommend this. Note that even though the individual solvers are still implicit solvers, this uh, the coupling scheme uh, is explicit because of the lack of sub-iteration. All right, so uh, one way uh, we have a converged solution field 
uh, it's obtained for one field, and then it's used as a boundary condition or an external load for the second field. It's again suitable for very weak coupling. Um, so you can determine maximum structural stresses from CS CFD results, but the strains are not significant enough to affect the flow field. Um, this is again very easily done with mechanical CFX or fluent. The data transfer is all handled. It's just a matter of connecting up wires in the project page. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples here. Uh, this one is uh, a 2D hyperelastic. Uh, there's two bodies here in a cross flow. Um, there's full mechanical contact between the two bodies. The CFD solver in this case is fluent, and it's using fluent's overset meshing capability which is uh, a really nice capability. And uh, forgive me, that did not play. There we go. So you can see the, uh, the cross flow is moving from left to right here, and it is impinging on these two hyperelastic bodies. And right there, you can see them bounce off of each other. So there's full contact here. The next example that I'm going to look at, um, this is a pressure pulse in a liquid carrying tube. So this might be a, some sort of medical application. Uh, an analysis like this uh, might be used to look at blood flow in an aorta or some other type of artery. So you can see what's happening here is the fluid flow is entering the top of the tube. It's exiting to the right here so it's got to uh, as it turns it's got to dump all this vertical momentum that exerts a downward force on the tube so when the pulse is applied it deflects the tube downward and this is the application that we're actually only we're actually going to take a look at uh, in the software so uh, if you'll give me one second this is the model that I'm going to build and if I can get out of PowerPoint and I'm going to fire up Workbench from scratch. Take a moment while it opens. I'll be working in 2019 R1, uh, but everything you see will work in uh, 19 as well. So I have a previously uh, built geometry that I'll show you. It was originally built in Design Modeler, but I'm going to open it up in Space Claim since that is my preferred tool these days. While that open is opening up, I'll briefly describe it. We have uh, two bodies of interest in this particular case. We have the fluid volume inside of the tube. And we also have uh, the tube itself, which will be represented with uh, a solid body, sorry, a surface body. Volume will be a solid. This is uh, has decided to open up on a different monitor. So once it's open, I'll move it over. Here we go. All right, so um, you can see there's two bodies here. The solid body is the flow volume. That will be what we use for our CFD calculation. And the surface body will be what we use for our structural calculation. So I'm going to take that. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build the transient structural model. And I'd like to have a nice rubber material. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to make it uh, a linear elastic uh, material rather than a hyper elastic. And we'll make it 10 megapascals and fairly incompressible.
I wanted to work through this example from start to finish just to illustrate how quick and easy it is to set up uh, even a fairly complex calculation using multiple solvers in the workbench environment. Everything is popping on my other monitor, so here we are. Um, we're going to set up the structural calculation, so we don't need the solid. I'm going to suppress that. My rubber hose or tube here, I'm going to make give a thickness of three millimeters, and I'm going to very quickly mesh this. I'm just going to insert one mesh control face meshing with uh, 50 internal divisions that will be interpreted as the um, axial number of divisions. Generate a mesh that will be adequate. You can turn on thick shells and beams here and see, get an idea of what uh, our tube looks like. I'm going to set up my structural calculation. I'm just going to grab the edges at both ends and fix them in place. And the last thing I need to do to set up my loading is tell it where is the fluid solid interface. That's that. The analysis settings are pretty straightforward. The time stepping is not actually handled by mechanical. It is handled by uh, system coupling at the workbench level. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn auto time stepping off. I'm going to set this to sub steps. Just tell it one. Again, these, these values are not really used. Um, under Restart controls, if I think I might want to restart this and run it for longer, um, I'm going to tell it to retain files after the solve. And that's pretty much it. This is now set up. This is ready to go. So we'll minimize that. And the next thing we're going to do is create the CFD analysis. I'll grab <coughs> a fluid flow CFX system, drag it out here and connect it to the geometry. So I'll use the same geometry. And we'll create a quick fluid mesh on our tube. And just like with um, the transient structural where we didn't need the solid and we suppressed it, uh, in creating our fluid mesh, we do not need the surface body. So we're going to suppress that. And I'm going to generate a mesh on this real quick. I like to use in an application like this, the multi-zone mesher. I'm going to tell it to sweep from the top here. And to get a nice mesh, I'm going to insert a face meshing on that. And last but not least, I'm going to inflate this mesh, this method, and let's make it a total thickness of two millimeters. And use three layers, and see what kind of mesh we get. So you can see we got a beautiful swept mesh here, a nice mapped. Uh, quad source face, target face looks good. It's a very high quality mesh, and we have uh, 14 or 15,000 nodes and elements. The last thing I'm going to do here is set up some name selections that I'll use later. Inlet, outlet, 
if this were uh, a fluent application, I would also name the walls, but I don't need to here since I'm going into CFX and the default boundary condition will be adequate. Um, so we've got a mesh for our CFD calculation. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to do um, a, an initial steady state uh, flow calculation as an initial condition, and then we'll plug that into a transient analysis. So let's open up CFX. Our working fluid is going to be water. We do not need uh, to solve any heat transfer equations, so I will disable them. I'll leave the analysis type steady state for now. Go into my default domain, switch my material to water, turn off heat transfer. I'll leave the turbulence model as K epsilon, it's fine here. Do not need to specify any domain initialization. CFX will figure that out from the boundary conditions. And for my boundary conditions, I have my inlet. Notice I named my uh, boundary condition inlet to match the name selection from the meshing application. It's found that and automatically filled in my location. I'm going to make this an opening boundary condition so I can drive it with uh, a total pressure. And for my steady state calculation, we'll just make that a small nominal value of 100 pascals. And then I'm going to create my outlet boundary condition. And again, it has filled in my location as outlet. Um, I'll make that also an opening, but it will be a static pressure outlet. So I have a total pressure inlet and a static pressure outlet. So I should have a well-defined, stable solution. And uh, last but not least, uh, this is a very small pressure gradient across this tube. It's going to result in a very low flow rate. Um, so I'm going to use a physical time scale here of half a second, which is fairly long. I'll leave everything else as, uh, as the default. And this is now ready to go. And I'm going to solve our steady state initial condition. I'm going to run in double precision because I always run in double precision. Probably don't have to in this particular model, but it rarely hurts and the cost is minimal. Um, I'll run it in parallel, although it's a very small model. It could be run in serial. This is the CFX Solver Manager. So CFX is currently writing the definition file. File It will then fire up the solver. There it goes. It's going to converge before I can finish talking about it. And this, this calculation is complete, but I'm just going to check on a few things to make sure everything looks well converged. Uh, I'm going to check on the mass flow that developed at the inlet and the outlet. You can see they are more or less flatlined and they are equal and opposite. That's good. And I'll check a couple other things. I usually like to check the imbalances in the domain. You can see they've all gone uh, uh, very close to zero. We could zoom, zoom in on the scale and see how close they are, but uh, they're adequate. And last but not least, I'm going to check the force components uh, on my wall, which is called default domain default. That's the default boundary condition. And the only thing left in it is the wall. And these, you can see as well, are pretty much flatlined. They are uh, close enough to be uh, an initial condition for our transient run. So this all looks good. So I'm going to close that. And I'm going to duplicate my steady state model, move it over here, keep things organized. I'll rename this steady state 
and I'll rename this transient. So the first thing we want to do is set this to transient. And uh, again, these time stepping controls are not used. We just need to enter some values here, but the time stepping is actually handled uh, by the system coupling. So the only thing we need to do now is let this model know uh, that the mesh can move. So we're going to turn on mesh deferment at the domain level regions of motion specified. And I'm not going to go too much into these settings. But I will just set the mesh stiffness to be a constant value. You'll notice we got a bunch of errors because now my boundary conditions want to know how they're going to move. So my inlet and an outlet uh, are going to be stationary. That's the default. So I can just come in here and check them and click OK. And my wall here, I'm going to set that to system coupling. <coughs> Hit OK. And last but not least, uh, I might want to monitor the movement of uh, my rubber tube during solution. So I'm going to define a monitor object. Uh, I'll call it total mesh displacement and I will select the quantity total mesh displacement to monitor and I'll just click somewhere here anywhere on the tube and I could define uh, transient results and um, all that kind of stuff but I, I won't bother here for this for our purposes the only other thing I need to do is define my pressure pulse because currently my pulse is a constant 100 pascals. So I'm going to create an expression here called pulse and I just so happen to have already this expression typed out and stored. I'll paste that in here, hit apply. We can plot that just so we can see what that pressure pulse is going to look like. You can see that it uh, rises from near zero up to around two atmospheres and then back down again by half a second. And I'll go in here and replace my constant relative pressure with the expression pulse. And this is now set up and ready to go. So I need to use my steady state solution as my initial condition. So I'm going to connect that over. And then I'm going to go down to my component systems and I'm going to grab system coupling, drag it over here to the right. And I will grab the setup cell from my transient structural, drag it onto the system coupling. The same thing with the setup cell from my transient CFD analysis drag that onto the system coupling, open up the system coupling setup, and there's just a few more steps. So the first thing that uh, we have to do is um, let's actually jump back here. Let's update that because we have a yellow check mark. Uh, sorry, a yellow lightning bolt. We'll do the same thing here. Not sure what that error is about, but uh, we're going to press on. All right. Okay, here we go. Now, um, notice we have for our participants the transient structural calculation uh, and the transient uh, CFD calculation. I'm going to grab my fluid solid interface from the transient structural, my domain. Def default boundary condition from the CFD, select them both with a, a click select, right click and choose create data transfer. And this creates two data transfers. 
there is uh, a set of participants. It tells it when to transfer. Uh, you can specify an under relaxation factor, a convergence target, whether the load is ramped, etc. And there is two because we're mapping pressures from the fluid field to the solid domain, and then we're mapping deformations from the solid domain back to fluid. So under our analysis settings, I'm going to give it an end time of 1 and a step size of 0, 1. Refresh my solution setup. And uh, last but not least, we probably better save it before we run it. And I'm going to try to run this. I, I have a, uh, a red X here. Not sure what that's about. But we'll see. There we go. Green check mark cleared. All I did was uh, update the upstream components. System coupling is a, a little bit unusual. Normally in workbench, um, objects or systems only depend on objects upstream of themselves. With system coupling, it's slightly unusual because both of these systems actually depend on the inputs of the system coupling, which is downstream of it. And now we should be ready to solve. I'm going to choose update. And what should happen, knock on wood, is both solvers will fire up. So <coughs> I'm going to move over my transient structural model. So this is the same mechanical session that we used to set it up. And we can come down here and click on the solution information. And we can watch our output live. We can see that uh, ANSYS is solving. These are our uh, coupling steps up here on the right. And last but not least, we can go back out to the project level. We can right click on solution and display monitors. And what we get is our CFX. So I'll make that a tad bit smaller. Go back to my system coupling page, my mechanical page, and CFX. And now I am fully monitoring all aspects of this FSI calculation while it is solving. All right. So um, I have already solved this, and I have it in a another already saved project. So while that's going on in the background, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in here to this solved transient structural model. Starting up mechanical. And we'll be able to review our results. <coughs> So here's my uh, total deformation result. I'm just going to look at all 100 frames before second animate it. 
So you can see the result of our pressure pulse. And if we wanted to, while we were at it, check out what the completed system coupling run looked like, uh, here it is. So you can see that uh, it took a few more coupling iterations per time step during the pulse. Then at the end, it got very easy to converge the loads. So the solution sped up quite significantly at the end of the calculation versus the beginning. And that is all that I have. Um, so I'm going to go over here to the chat window. And I see a question in there, although I can't make out the full question. Boz, can you read that question? I'm only seeing the middle of it. Uh, yeah, the question, uh, Mike, was would this uh, presentation be available? The person asked the question had to go to a meeting, and I did answer them that, and anybody else that would like a um, recording, um, this will be available on our website um, at www.mallet.com under webinars. There will be a link to a recording of this if anybody um, wants to share it with a colleague or watch it again. Okay. Um, so at this time, I'm going to open up the floor to other questions. If you do have another question, please um, type it in the chat window. Um, I didn't mean to, sorry. Um. So uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. And again, this is just uh, this is just one methodology for solving a two-way FSI problem. Um, this is supported for uh, Fluent as well as CFX. It is um, supported in multiple different ways in Fluent. So in uh, in CFX, the uh, the movement of the structure on the CFD side is handled by mesh deformation. Um, that is true on the Fluent side as well, but Fluent also has the overset meshing capability, uh, which is really, uh, it, it's a really nice way to be able to create a robust CFD mesh because you don't have to necessarily um, contiguously mesh the fluid volume. You can have, for example, a simple Cartesian background mesh and then just an inflated extruded mesh near the surface uh, uh, surfaces of your of your objects. So um, like this example, you can see that the mesh around these hyperelastic bodies is actually overset onto a background Cartesian mesh uh, that simplifies uh, setting up the meshes, um, simplifies uh, sometimes uh, the uh, mesh deformation that has to occur in a fluid structure interaction problem like this. It's slightly more complex to set up in fluent um, that's why I chose to present the CFX example. Uh, but uh, in either case, um, setting up the two-way problem in Workbench is pretty much just as easy as you saw connecting wires and uh, setting a few time-stepping settings. Yeah, Mike, there was one more question about is this um... – Will this be exportable to PowerPoint or Excel? Um, yes. Um, so, yeah, if you would like that, um, you know, just uh, email me, boz at mal.com directly, and, and I can get you that information. So I'm not sure whether, que whether the question was about um, the presentation slides themselves which is in PowerPoint, and I can make that available um, to Boz. 
or whether or not the results from uh, the analysis could be uh, exported to PowerPoint or Excel, and the answer is yes to both. Um, it's pretty straightforward. For example, in Mechanical here, um, to copy individual images to the clipboard, uh, we can write this uh, animation file in a number of different formats, MP4, WMV, AVI, even animated GIF. Um, our results uh, objects, our results uh, data uh, can be exported to um, a text file. Uh, we can um, export the deformed shape to an STL file or even an ANSYS uh, viewer file, which is a 3D viewing format that you can view with a, uh, a freely distributable um, viewing application. Yeah, uh, but we'll, we'll probably um, um, convert that to a PDF to send it out. Yes. Just for... All right. Any other questions? Well, Mike, I don't see any more in the um, questions pane. Um, so, it, but if anybody does come up with questions, you can always um, get a hold of me at bositmallet.com. And like I said before, everything's been recorded. So, um, you know, feel free to share it with your colleagues. We'll go back to look at any portion of it. Um, it'll be on. YouTube, but you can link to it from our uh, webinar section on our website at mallet.com. So again, Mike, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Thank you, Boz. Uh, Thanks everybody for uh, Very informative. Attending. And again, we'll be doing a presentation um, next week, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern. Thank you everyone and have a nice weekend.